How do you build a great church? We aren't talking bricks and stained glass windows. If you could create an amazing church, what would it look like? Most would say it has to be friendly, caring, somewhere where you feel known, more like a community or even family. It has to be excited about serving. Churches just don't happen. It's all hands on deck, come early, stay late, whatever it takes type attitudes. Churches thrive when people give of their time and talents and resources, wholeheartedly investing them in the kingdom of God. But a church isn't just some volunteer organization. It is a Holy Spirit-led movement to change the world. This movement advances by us sharing Jesus both near and far, by sowing and going. A great church has to swing for the fence. It's got to be willing to do things a little different and dream a little bigger. It can't just focus on where it's at, but where it's going. There has to be a God-given hunger that there is more to be accomplished. Society is tired of fake. A church has to be real and relatable. Broken people restored by God's amazing grace. When you are a part of a great church, you don't just go, you grow. It's not about attending a service, but being part of a team. Everyone together growing to know God more. You see, a church helps people find a real relationship with a real God. You can build a great church if you remember who the builder is. Jesus said, I will build my church. Peter said, each of us are living stones. So how do you build a great church? Let's find out. So how do you build a great church? Let's find out this morning. Guys, we're continuing in our building block series here. We got 10 building blocks at WCAG, and this morning's building block, why don't you say it with me, is empowered. Let's say it again, empowered, all right. So this morning building block, I am super excited to talk about. This is one of my favorite building blocks here at WCAG, and we're going to be talking about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to accomplish incredible things for the kingdom of God, but we're also going to be talking about how people uh, feel empowered from the leadership of the local church to use their giftings and talents and abilities to change people's lives, lives through Jesus Christ. Now, so you might be thinking, man, Pastor Sheldon, you tripped over your words there, and that was a bunch of gibberish. I didn't really catch any of that. But uh, don't worry, we're going to unpack all of that this morning, all of the things that we just talked about. You might uh, be sitting here this morning, and maybe if you're newer to church, this might be an interesting word that you're like, okay, I could, I could get some of the other ones, relational, service, generosity. I could connect the dots on those ones. But this one's a little bit different. It uh, I'm not really sure that I can connect the dots on these. So uh, this morning, we are going to uh, be connecting the dots. We believe that WCAG is a great church, and one of the reasons why WCAG is a great church is it is our desire for every believer that attends this church here to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and by the local church as well. Let's take our Bibles this morning. We're going to start in a very odd place. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The context of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is, is very interesting because um, Paul is writing to the local church and he's talking about sexual purity. And within the context of this sexual purity that he's talking to them about, there is this incredible topic that Paul brings up. It's an amazing, amazing theological statement that as a Christian, the Holy Spirit actually lives inside of you. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verses 19 and 20. He says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. Anyone know what that price is? would possibly be Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, right? So we purchased with a great price so that you must, so you must honor God with your body. So if you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, if you call yourself a Christian, if you've repented of your sins, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of you. So you actually carry around with you the Holy Spirit. 
So Paul is saying the Holy Spirit is inside of you, and he says if the Holy Spirit is inside of you, if that is what's going on here, then I would encourage you, he's encouraging the church, to live a life that is pleasing to God. So we have to understand that the power of the Holy Spirit resides inside of us. But there's also this thing in the Bible, in the book of Acts, called the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and that is the empowerment to tell other people about Jesus Christ. And so not only does the the Holy Spirit live inside of you, but there is this empowerment for a purpose. We're going to look at that real quick in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Some of you will be really familiar with this passage, but flip in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, a very common passage of Scripture when you're talking about being empowered. It's this, Jesus was saying this uh, to the disciples and basically the formation of the early church. He said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. So the purpose of this empowerment that that people would receive, the the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, was so that they could be witnesses to tell people everywhere about Jesus, even to the ends of the earth. I heard people say, someone said this once, they said, you know what, Watford City is not the end of the earth, but you can see it from there, okay? So we are taking Jesus to every place on the, pla- on the face of the planet, down every single gravel road. At the end of every gravel road, there's somebody down that road that needs to know Jesus. And the Bible says that we are empowered to be witnesses, and that is still the purpose of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It is to bring Jesus to the ends of the earth. Now when we think about empowerment, we usually think of two things. Well, the first one is we think of a person being given power, like supernatural power. But the next thing that we uh, think of is a person being given permission. If you've been empowered, you've been given permission. Tia is my oldest daughter, and one day when she was about 12 or 13 years old, um, I decided that it would be a great day to teach her how to drive the bobcat on the farm. We just thought, you know what, it's sitting there, this, is, this could be a fun event, and so let's do this. And so for those of you that, that have never driven or tried to drive a bobcat, it, it is quite a process, okay? Um, it's, it's not like driving a car, it's very different, it's more like driving a tank, and who gets an opportunity to do that? And so uh, we throw Tia into the bobcat. Actually, driving, driving a bobcat for the first time is kind of like driving or um, riding a mechanical bobcat bull that you're controlling okay that's what it is that no one laughed so no one's really been on a mechanical bull before obviously but um you've seen people you know you get in a bobcat and you start moving these levers to try and get it to move forward and back and you're jumping and bouncing around all over the place until you can kind of try and move so tia's in there and she's bouncing around in the bobcat and her little ponytail is flying around and 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 it looks like the machine is having seizures and stuff like that and and finally we get things smoothed out i say okay you got to be really smooth and and push push the handles this way, pull the handles to go back, and then all of a sudden I said, okay, now stop. Now we're going to move the bucket up and down, and we're going to tip it, and we're going to learn all of these, and so I'm standing far enough back that I'm in a safe position, and we're moving these things around, and, and she's having a great time, and so then I said, okay, pick up some of this gravel and move it over here and move it over there. How many know, like, this is the reason we have children? Like, if you can teach them at 12 to run the bobcat, you don't have to go out in the winter anymore. You know, like, this is a great idea. And so you're saying, man, if I could uh, do this. But anyway, she picks up and moves some things around, runs around the farm, finally kind of gets the hang of it. I said, great, uh, that's lesson number one. We'll park the bobcat. We did that. Little did I know that uh, about a week later, um, I would be out, I think it was either out of town or I wasn't available, and someone came to our, our farm, our little farm, and they needed to pick something up, but the bobcat was in the way. And Mom didn't know that I gave Tia the Bobcat lesson, okay? And so Jen comes out, we homeschool, uh, we're homeschooling all of our kids at that time, and so when mom leaves, that means school is out. Like all the kids, they just go running wild all the way, everywhere. And so they all come running out to see who came and, and visit with this person, and, and Jen says, sadly, she says, I'm sorry, you know what, uh, my, my husband's not here, the Bobcat's in the way, I don't know how to run the Bobcat, I'm sorry, we'll just, he, he can't, he's not available. 
And then out of this mulling around of kids, all of a sudden this 12-year-old girl goes, I know how to run the bobcat. Everybody's like, come on. She goes, no, for real. And she just jumps up in the bobcat. She toggles the switch, gets the glow plugs going, everything like that. Room fires up the diesel engine, smoke, it roars to life. And everybody's going like, oh, no. What is going on here? She slowly raises the bucket and kind of jerky, herky-jerky, moves it around, drives it out of the way, puts the bucket down, shuts the key off, and jumps out all teeth. (laughs) So here's the thing. Why did Tia have the confidence to jump up in there and move the bobcat with just one lesson? I'm going to tell you why. Because she felt empowered. can do this. I, we, we did it. I mean, this is, this is kind of like, uh, yeah, we, I encouraged her and taught her, but she also learned by riding the mechanical bull around the yard a little bit and through kind of rough, you know, patches and trying to figure everything out. And so she felt empowered enough to say, not only has someone given me permission, but I also, through trial and error, have learned how to do this. You know what, guys? Here's the thing. Jesus is our role model in this. And what did Jesus say when he called his first disciples? This this is really amazing. It's found in Mark chapter 1, verse 17. So flip there uh, in your Bibles today or your electronic device. It'll be on the screen. Mark chapter 1, verse 17, and I want you to watch how Jesus unpacks this, uh, we're going to teach you how to drive the bobcat type thing to his disciples, this empowerment. Mark chapter 1, verse 17. So, context of the verse here, Jesus is obviously walking past some disciples who their normal career was fishing. So he drive, or drives, he walks past them, he doesn't drive. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 17, he says this, Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. He says, I will show you how to fish for people. And the whole time of Jesus' ministry, he was pouring into this group of disciples so that they could ultimately be empowered enough to carry on the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. He says, I am going to teach you, and I'm going to empower you to fish for people. In John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Jesus encouraged this learning mentality through trying You know, this is amazing, guys, because oftentimes we think that when God empowers us, we immediately get it right. How many of you have experienced that? When God God empowers you, you immediately get it right. You never make a mistake again. Oh, no one. You know what? That's even in Scripture, guys, that Jesus actually taught through kind of like this this organic trial and error riding the mechanical bull type thing when it came to empowerment. Jesus here, when we see in Matthew chapter 17, there was a time where where he let his disciples try and cast out a demon out of a young boy, and and it didn't go so well. And the father comes up to Jesus and says, hey man, your guys aren't doing a very good job over here. And Jesus goes, okay, the reason why this demon didn't come out was because demons only come out certain ones with prayer and fasting. And so he does kind of like this real-time coaching with his disciples where they couldn't do it, but Jesus teaches them. In Luke chapter 10, uh, verses 1 through 3, let's flip there because there's all of a sudden there's this larger group of disciples. The Bible says that there's 72 of these disciples, people who had been following Jesus around, and Jesus empowers them to go out and do ministry here in Luke chapter 10. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 10, Verses 1 through 3. Guys, I I feel like I'm talking a million miles an hour today. It's because I'm excited, okay? I'm sorry. But Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, it says this. The Lord chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. 
So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you as lambs among wolves. Guys, I really think that in, I don't think you're taking anything away from this passage, that when Jesus says that the harvest is great and the workers or the laborers are few, you need to pray to the Lord of the harvest to, he, it says, send out laborers. I really feel like you can replace this word. You could say, ask the Lord of the harvest to empower laborers to go out into the harvest field. Have them head out into the harvest field. Jesus was empowering these 72 people to go out. They were to, you know, the Bible tells us that they came back all excited. They said, man, the demons are subject to us in Jesus' name. This is so amazing what God is doing. And Jesus was like, listen, don't get excited because demons are, uh, you feel like you have control over demons in my name. He says, be excited because your name is written in heaven. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's why you should be excited. So he was sending them out to do ministry to share with people the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we see here that Jesus was empowering these people to go, and he came back, or they they all came back excited, and we see that these were average, regular Joe-type people, but they were empowered to do God's work. And this culture of empowerment was a key component in the early church, that everyone was empowered to do the Lord's work. Listen to that again. That everyone, everyone, who's everyone? Everyone, everyone was empowered to do God's work. That was the culture of the early church. I'm going to show it to you. It's found actually, one of, the, one of these progressions is a beautiful picture in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. So if you want to flip over there, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, we're going to look at this empowerment structure almost of getting everyone to be empowered in the local church. So 2 Timothy 2, 2, this is Paul writing to a young pastor named Timothy, and this is what he says in verse 2. He says, you have heard me, so this me is Paul. So he says, you have heard me teaching things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now, you could insert Timothy, because he's talking, now you, Timothy, teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. So let's see this empowerment pathway. Ultimately, Jesus, he speaks to Paul. Paul speaks to Timothy. Timothy gives it to trustworthy people, and trustworthy people ultimately give it to other people. This was really the ultimate empowerment of the early church, that every single person was a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guys, I'm going to say something that that might be unpopular, uh, might even be unpopular within churches or even within pastors, but I'm going to say it this morning. Guys, I believe that one of the greatest detriments to the American church is the professionalization of ministry. Now, who's saying that statement? Me. And what am I? I'm a professional minister. But I think that one of the greatest detriments in the American church is the professionalization of ministry. Where somehow people get this notion that they say, you know what, I'm going to come to church every Sunday to hear the professional Christian teach me about the Bible. Or even worse, guys, in our culture, we see that church has shifted very much into an entertainment mentality. That the church or the preacher should entertain me, or the music should be just the way that I like it, or the production should be something that keeps my, uh, keeps my, um, my juice is flowing in the aspect of I always want to come back because I want to know what the next thing is going to happen, that this great production. And, and basically, if I don't get this great production or I, I don't get this professionalization of ministry, some of the professional Christian teaching me all of these things, well then ultimately, if I don't get what I want and I don't like the way that worship is or the certain songs that they sing, then you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to a different church and I'm going to find what I want. And we have this this 
this lost mentality that every person in the local church is, are the ministers. We've lost that. And guys, from the Word of God, I, I drastically see a lot of the things that we've already talked about, but what I see here is this. This is what church is really supposed to be like. That Jesus said, he said, listen, to his disciples, they were empowered. The, the early church, all of the believers were empowered. And then, but the question is this morning, here at WCAG, do people sense that they are empowered? That's the question that we need to ask ourselves. And honestly, guys, of all of the, the 10 building blocks, this is the one I probably get the most pushback on. This is the one that, that, that most people push back. They, they, there are a lot of people that have this mentality that they think that the church should do all the ministry. And, and this is what they say. They'll, they'll come up to me and they'll say something like this. Pastor Sheldon, what's the church going to do about, and then you fill in the blank, whatever it is. What, what's the church going to do about this? What's the church going to do about hurricane response in the coast? Pastor Sheldon, what's the church going to do about reaching a certain people group in our community? What's the church going to do about feeding homeless people? Pastor Sheldon, what's the church going to do about struggling marriages? And you know how I answer that question every single time? I say, I don't know. What are you going to do about it? Because here's the thing, if, if you're the church, if, you, if we're the church, if this is the early church mentality, that what we're trying to do, that, that if, if you're passionate about a certain topic, and God has, is probably speaking to you then, and if you can't sleep at night, if you're losing sleep at night because God is nudging you about a certain thing that's happening in the community, then guess what? If you've got the vision, you got the job. Ding! Right? That's what the early church was about. That, that they were saying, and I'm breaking my box up here, but the, if you got the vision, you got the job. Basically, we're saying, listen, uh, it, it's not, guys, and, and hear me out here. Uh, um, I, I have, I've done this so often that I'm starting to hear like this backflow from people saying things like this. Well, they'll say, uh, man, Pastor Sheldon, so-and-so was afraid to tell you about this thing that was really heavy on their heart. They're afraid because if they tell you, then you're just going to say, well, go for it. And then all of a sudden, they're going to feel responsible. They're like, oh, no. And, and guys, here's the thing. I want you to understand, I'm not doing that because I don't like the idea when someone comes and shares that. And I'm not doing that because I'm a jerk even if some people think I am, okay? And I'm not doing it because I'm lazy, guys. The reason why I'm doing it is it because I wholeheartedly believe that this was the way the local church was designed to be biblically. That all of us, every last person, if you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you carry with you the Holy Spirit. You are empowered to do the work that God has called you to do. Every single last one. And if you still have breath to breathe, you're not out of the game. God's the only one that says it's time for the game to be done. Okay? So we know, all of us, every single last one of us, guys, our mission as church leadership should be to empower spirit-led disciples to change our world. That's what we need to be doing. In fact, I'm going to show it to you in Scripture. In Ephesians chapter 4, jump there with me. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at this together. Verses 11 and 12. This is an interesting passage of Scripture. Paul's writing to the Ephesian church, and he explains... Uh, some of the leadership structures in the early church, but he says this is what it's for. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, 12, I believe that the leadership structures are for empowerment. And we can see that here. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. These, these were kind of like leadership 
uh, structure people in the early church. Then in verse 12, it says, their responsibility is. So the, those people that are in leadership structure, what's their responsibility? The Bible tells, Paul says, this is what their responsibility is. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church the body of Christ. So in my mind, I see two things here, that the leadership structure, the church's early leadership structure, their job was to equip all the believers to do what? To do God's work. And the second thing was, they were to build up the church, which is the body of Christ. So basically, I believe that their job was to empower and to encourage. That was their, that was their job, to empower and to encourage. So basically, they were just to, to shout out, shout out over the roar of the, the bobcat engine. You're doing great. Keep going. Move the stick a little bit more this way. Raise the bucket a little bit higher. That was really the, the leadership structure of the early church. Everyone was doing ministry. And they're saying their job was to empower and to encourage. This is a crude illustration, but I thought it worked kind of good. So we'll use it. You know, um, I think that, that we have turned the local church into a zoo, okay? I'm not saying that because I'm looking out at you guys, okay? I'm just, we have turned the local church into a zoo. I'll keep reading my notes. Where we take all of these different kinds of people and we lock them up in rooms on Sundays and Wednesdays. And we keep all the most gifted and the coolest people and we confine them to the church building. That's what a zoo's job is, right? Like a zoo just takes all the cool animals, locks them up in cages so that you can come by and see these cool animals and, and enjoy yourself as you parade through the zoo. So that's the job of the zoo. But what if we changed the game? Instead of people coming to the zoo, what if we just unlocked all the cages and let the wild animals run crazy? What if we did that? What if instead we just said, you know what? Let's not just confine all of the things that God does within the four walls of this building, but that we would say, Let's charge out in our community empowered, spirit-led disciples about to change our world. Pastor Peyton Jones, when speaking about empowering every believer, said this, it's about opening the zoo and releasing gospel animals out into the community. Basically, guys, I don't think, I don't think my job as the lead pastor of WCAG is to provide gospel entertainment on Sunday mornings. My biblical responsibility as the lead pastor at WCAG is to encourage a movement in our community, in our region. The mobilization of every single Christian that attends WCAG in first service, in Fairview, in second service, online right now. The mobilization of those, every Christian, to do the work of the ministry, to send out into the communities and workplaces people that would shine the light of Jesus Christ with every action and every word, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, to be a living example of Acts 1-8, telling people everywhere about Jesus, even to the ends of the earth. Guys, it's time to rattle the cages and release the gospel animals out into the community. Because Lowell Lundstrom once said, Pastor John, the gospel runs fast in the streets. The gospel runs fast in the streets. Guys, for many years now, we have encouraged people here at WCAG to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to step out, to take risks. We want people to feel like they have pre-approval, that they are empowered to try new things, to do things a little bit different. And WCAG is full of empowered leaders, people that, that teach classes and lead ministry trips and people that head up ministries. And we've got youth that are leading worship on Wednesday nights. We've got kids who are leading games over, with their peers. We've got people who lead Bible studies at homes and in workplaces and on Zoom. We've got people who are sharing Jesus Christ with their friends on a daily basis. We have people who 
who live out what it means to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. But this is why empowered is one of the building blocks of WCAG. you got to answer the why question. And I believe this is it. That many churches celebrate people coming to their thing, but at WCAG, we celebrate people doing God's thing. A lot of churches celebrate people coming to their thing, come to the zoo, check out all the cool animals. But at WCAG, we want to be a biblical type model church that we say this isn't about coming and seeing our thing, but this is about doing God's thing. That we celebrate people doing God's thing. Empowered means that every single person in this room, every single person that has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is a full-time minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, there's so many Christians that try and separate that. They try and say, well, oh, hey, looking on their calendar, oh, you know what day it is? It's Sunday. Light switch. Ching. I'm a Christian today, right? They walk out the door. Oh, hey, it's whatever, Wednesday night. Oh, hey, it's Easter. Oh, hey, it's Christmas. Ching. I'm a Christian. Here we go. You know, and listen, guys, I want you to understand, there is no light switch. Amen. There is no light switch. It's on or it's off. It's all in or it's all out. It's saying, God, use me every single day. That means that every moment of every day that we just wake up. And you know when, when you wake up and, you, and your eyes are all blurry but you know you're alive? You know, some have experienced that, you know, you, oh, I'm, I think I'm alive, you know, and you, you wake up. In those moments, when your eyes are blurry, at that moment, at that moment, you have to come to the realization right now, God has given me another day to live for him. God has given me another day to live for him. And even before your eyes unblur, at that moment, could we all commit to saying, God, you've given me another day to live. God, direct me. Lead me, guide me, use me to the, for the furtherance of the kingdom of God today. So doesn't that take a little bit of the pressure off? Doesn't that go, man, all of these things that you carry around as duty, oh, I really should be doing that, oh, I really, it, and it just becomes so natural that every moment of every day you just say it's devoted to Jesus. And we watch as the empowerment of the Holy Spirit flows through our lives where we get rid of the light switch we just say, yeah, this is what it's about. That I serve Jesus with every waking moment of my life. That I listen to the nudge of the Holy Spirit. That I'm looking and I'm watching for God's direction all the time. That we're not walking in our own strength or in our own power, but we are literally empowered by the strength of the Holy Spirit. We are empowered for a purpose. Guys, nothing super significant happens when you attend a church service as an audience, I said it. Nothing significant happens if you just attend a church service as an audience. But something supernatural can happen. Listen to me, guys. Something supernatural can happen when we, as empowered believers, allow our lives to intersect with other people's lives. And then through the power of the Holy Spirit, we all, all of us, become the hands and the feet and the mouth of Jesus to a broken and hopeless world. That's what empowerment is. So this is what we're going to do this morning. This is how we're going to tie up today. We can have our worship team come at this time. I want to read one more passage of Scripture. It'll be up on the screen just for you to, to catch today. It's from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says this. It says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through the Holy Spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. 
Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. We could talk multiple Sundays just about these two verses. But this is where we're going to try and land the plane this morning. Guys, I believe that God, through his glorious and unlimited resources, wants to empower every last person in this room. He wants to give you the strength that you need to serve him and love him. And maybe you're here this morning and you would say, you know what, Pastor Sheldon? I kind of live my life with the light switch thing. It's kind of like at times I, I flip the switch, like I'm a Christian, I'm not a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm not a Christian. And today might be a great day to reevaluate that. And today might be an incredible day to say, God, this is my all-in moment. Because you know what, guys? My life changed when I had an all-in moment. I was really good at flipping the switch. I was really good at flipping the switch. Guys, I think in, in this moment today, right now, that we would say, God, from your unlimited resources, will you empower me with inner strength through your Holy Spirit? Maybe this morning, guys, during this closing song, the worship team's gonna do a closing song. Maybe you would ask God, you would say, God, I need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit today. I need fresh strength to make it through this week. Maybe you might say, God, forgive me for not being available to you. There have been times when you've nudged me. There have been times when, you, when you've spoke something to me and I've just said, no, God, I don't want to do that. Maybe you're here and, and you're just saying, you know what? God, reveal to me new ways that I can step out and be obedient to you. Say, God, I'm going to ask you to pray a crazy, scary, courageous prayer today that you would say, God, I want to be empowered today. Will you empower me today so that it's not just me drifting through life, that I'm not just sitting on a train looking for my ticket? Say, I know who I am, but I have no idea where I'm going. But instead, each day is this incredible adventure along with God. Every day is listening for the voice, the direction, the clarity for God to speak to your heart. You don't do your devotions because you have to. You flip open the word of God because you know that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you. and is going to say something new and fresh and alive to you. You don't go to church because it's some obligation and you want to be part of an audience. You go to church so that you can connect with people and all of these building blocks, the relational, the service, the generosity, the empowerment, and all of the other ones, that you can receive those and be filled again and fresh and anew and walk out to be on mission with what God has for your life. So this morning, this is what we're going to do today as we're going to tie up. We're going to have our closing song. And in the, the last moments, I'm going to ask you to, to pray courageously today as we're worshiping God to say, God, use me in a powerful way. God, speak to me. Bring clarity to my life. I want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So let's stand together this morning. We're going to have the worship team play this song. I'd encourage you to worship God. We're also, what we're going to do this morning is we're also going to open up the altars this morning, which that means if you would like to slip from your seat and you would just like to come and either kneel or stand and just open your heart up to God, say, God, uh, pour into me in a fresh new way. But we just encourage you, if you'd like to respond that way, you can. If you want to stay in your seats, that's fine as well and respond to God right where you're at. But we're going to ask God to pour into us and fill us out. After the worship team plays, Pastor John is going to come up and, and he's just going to share and close in prayer this morning. So let's pray together. Father, right now in Jesus' name, we're just asking that God, you would empower us, Lord Jesus. God, from your glorious resources that you want to empower us as spirit-led disciples to change our world, that God, you would give us the strength, that you would give us the permission, that you would give us the authority. We ask God that you would pour into our lives in powerful ways, that we could hear with clarity the voice of the Holy Holy Spirit, the nudge of God each day, that God, as we walk through life, that Lord, we would not just be drifting through life, but we would be on mission, we would be on purpose every single day of our life. We thank you, Jesus. So guys, let's respond to the Holy Spirit this morning.
Friends, we're so glad that we could spend this hour of worship, an hour in the presence of God. For this is the very heartbeat of God's heart for each of us. We pray that this core value, this building block of WCAG, my church, your church, would be so alive and personal. But this is more than the heartbeat and the building block of WCAG. For this is the heartbeat of our God for you, for me. Perhaps this is the day in the sermon that you needed to hear. Perhaps this is God just nudging you. I said, I've been calling you. It's time to go. I got work for you to do. I want to share with you an amazing scripture. And then I want to reopen up the altars because we want to anoint your hands today and we want to send you forth as they did in the New Testament. But in the book of Romans, the eighth chapter, 
Romans chapter 8 deals with living life in the Spirit and in the fullness and the power of God. Listen to the words that the Apostle Paul said to the believers in the Church of Rome. He simply made this statement. Church, Christ lives within you. The Holy Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives and dwells in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give you life, life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit that lives and dwells within you. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is within you to empower you to impact your family, your children, your grandchildren, your world. And I want to pray. I want to invite those of you who feel led just to come as we are going to anoint hands this morning. For those of you who want to be used and just mighty way, please come as I pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we just humble ourselves in your sight this morning as we stand in the very presence of God. Father, thank you for the heartbeat of this assembly, that we embrace the Word of God. We take the Word of God as it is declared, that the same Spirit of God that raised Christ Jesus from the dead that resurrection spirit, that resurrection power lives and dwells within each one of us as believers. And Father, it's your desire to fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Life has a way of emptying our spiritual tanks, but the Spirit of God fills our tanks. And we pray even now as we yield ourselves, as we ask God, Lord, anoint me, set me apart, empower me, God that I can be a greater light and witness to people I love and people I work with and people that I do life with. Father, I pray now that even as we would anoint hands of those who are saying, I want to be used by God, I want to be empowered by God to touch my world and to impact people with the love of God. And Father, I pray that each person at the sound of my voice would know that they are the object of your love. And God, you are all that they need, for you are perfect. And I pray now your blessing upon the body of Christ. Father, may this not just be a building block, but may this be the testimony of WCAG. May this be the anointing of your spirit upon each person at the altar today, where they are saying, God, I want to be used by you. Nothing is going to stop me, young and old alike, at the altar today. Now, Lord, as we anoint these hands, Lord, we pray that you would send us out as an army of God, as an army of your love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.